aspects. On this panel, you, are, you will hear permaculturists from Lebanon, Italy, Iraq, Philippines, and Afghanistan speak of how permaculture is proving it is necessary, flexible, and valuable. Our lead here will be Ms. Ro Morrow. Rosemary Morrow trained in agricultural science, rural sociology, development, and horticulture. But after spending time in Africa, she realized there needed to be a better alternative to conventional agricultural practices. She found this in the ethics and integrated applied science of permaculture and has been teaching permaculture ever since. She's the author of numerous publications, including the Earth, User, Earth User's Guide to Permaculture, which has been translated into seven languages. And the Earth User's Guide to Teaching Permaculture has been, oh, sorry. Oh, that's a different book, sorry. <laughs> has been translated into two languages. She states that it is not true that permaculture design courses are accessible to everyone. Roe has committed her work to give access in some of the most challenging places and situations, such as areas hit by health epidemics, natural, disaster, natural disasters, war-torn areas, and post-war locations. I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Ms. Roe Morrow. Well, this is a ITC of enormous diversity. Looking at you from here, we can see people from so many different countries and places. It's magnificent. So welcome, everyone. Now, very, very soon you'll get hungry so that I think I won't spend time thanking everyone except we have explained the panel. With climate change, and per permaculture's unfolding ability to adapt. It adapts to almost everything and becomes relevant. We have recently, over the last two years, moved into a whole new world of permaculture called permaculture for refugees. And what an extraordinary time it is, with half a million Rohingya moving into Bangladesh, 400,000 Filipina displaced, half a million who are the Syrians in Kurdistan. So what we're going to talk about is how permaculture has been working. So instead of me giving you a talk, I thought that you would hear from the people who are doing it. I was in Kurdistan this year and I will speak only to the section I know, but our panellists who are Amani Dagar from Lebanon, Ray Right. Sarah Quablatown from the Philippines. Um, Francis Simonetti from Italy. All working in different parts of permaculture. So working on the principle you don't speak for other people. I also we've also called in Kabul. Afghanistan, Kabul. I'd just like to introduce a little bit about Kabul. So this is Zarguna. Kabul has been under active fighting, killing, war, bombing for more than 40 years. It's a long time to have generations growing up not knowing peace. Despite this, a group of young people together with a a uh, Singaporean doctor became totally committed to the only way forward is peace. War can never solve the problem. They've had all sorts of people bring it. You know, the Russians brought peace, the Taliban brought peace, the Americans brought peace, the Australians jumped in and said we're bringing peace. War has never brought peace. So they have lived under war, but their response to war is let's practice non-violence. Let's practice permaculture as one of the arts of peace. So today, after a really bad link yesterday, we've been able to get Dr. Hakim available and Zaguna, who leads the permaculture project under conditions that most of you would never be able to support, and I do for short time. The conditions under which they work, the bombs, the drones, the whole 
massive embankment, the tanks in the streets, the snipers, they are, say, permaculture is the way forward to peace. So what we're going to look at are the push factors from Kabul towards creating refugees and then we'll look at three refugee situations. So should I summarise that again? The push factors that Kabul exhibits to get 7 million or so refugees leaving, the conditions under which they live and thrive, two, nearly 2 million internally displaced people and then we will ask Raguna and Hakim to speak. Um, are we ready to go? You'll have to listen carefully, but Hakim is very clear. Zaguna is a little bit shy. So if we're ready, Kathy, could we? Live from Kabul, perhaps, if it gets through. It's so difficult in Kabul, it's difficult to imagine, so let's see. Can you hear us? Yes. Hooray! Give it. I am Jaguna, coordinator of the Afghan Peace Volunteers to seek to build a green, equal, and environment world with that war. War is the main push factor that forces Afghans to become refugees. War is now raging in most of the 34 provinces of Afghanistan, displacing 1.2 million Afghans within their country. And over the decades, more than 6.7 million Afghans abroad. Other important push factors are the lack of jobs and the inability to meet basic human needs like food and water. Thanks to this medic, <coughs> we are learning how to use some culture to produce food, which is necessary not only for refugees, but also for those of us left behind. Dr. Ha Kim Yong, Singaporean. Singaporeans be proud. I am Dr. Ha Kim Yong, a medical doctor working with the Guna and the Afghan Peace Volunteers in Kabul. The push factors of war, the lack of jobs, and the inability to meet basic human needs are connected to one another. And the more we connect the dot, the more we realize that driving all these push factors is our global elite and the social economic system they maintain. These elite 1% now represent the worst of our species. They no longer care for our earth and our society. They drive a profiteering warring system that is not designed to care for much else other than themselves. Science, math, evidence and experience clearly show us that the current social economic system is not working. These conventional methods are no longer effective, even if they once were. Recently, a BBC journalist analyzed that the current food famine in Yemen is not so much a food famine as it is a man-made political famine. The Afghan Peace Volunteers and I understand this when we visit Afghan refugees in Kabul. Wars created by man-made political parties lead 
to a famine of food, of values, and of everything that makes us decent human beings. So when we observe that the system is the engine behind the push factors, we ought to be careful not to join the system and thus become complicit partners in crime. If the system pushes for the false success of corporate governments and agri-businesses that leaves millions hungry, we need to plant our food without them and redefine success. If the system pushes us to chase after the usual money and power, we should resist by shunning wealth and status and caring for all of life. Kabul University's agriculture faculty is today teaching industrial agriculture. So the Afghanki volunteers and I applied the skills Rosemary taught us to establish a demonstration permaculture plot on one of the faculty's plots of land. We are attempted to think of ourselves as less than nothing, especially in the face of seemingly enormous push factors. We are sometimes fearful because civilians are being killed in record numbers. But like you and your permaculture communities in India and elsewhere, I suggest that all of us are like earthworms, unseen, but doing the very needed work of healing ourselves and our world. Like earthworms, we are creatures of water, male and female, young and old, of many species, and interdependent on Mother Nature. We don't need to be rich with fancy cars or clothes. We need food, not salary. Though we do not breathe through our skins like earthworms, we can see through the skins of all the greedy corporate vultures and politicians. We earthworms simply don't like them. For that, I thank the Afghan Peace Volunteers and thank all of you in Hyderabad for caring for the earth, caring for people, and for sharing whatever we have, for being a worldwide family of earthworms. Perhaps we can help save us from ourselves. Many elitist factors may be trying to push us towards business as usual and to make us feel small and alone. But person by person, soil by soil, we are pushing back. Thank you very much. Dhanabad. Well, earthworms, you're all earthworms. Quietly working your way under the soil against the whole chemical nature of things. Thank you, Hakim. That was fantastic. Bye -bye. Hooray. Yeah. So what we'd like to do now is just look at a few slides of Kabul. We'll show three slides that are negative and then the rest that are positive and I will hand over to Amani. The topic of the talk, the difficulty and potential contribution of permaculture to mass migration. I think you know in the future we might go from 25 million to 200 million refugees. Governments aren't ready. NGOs are bureaucratic and clogged up. And it's going to be up to us to push for systems. And our image is one of eco-villages and echo communities and echo neighbourhoods with people who may come to live in our lands. But let's have a look at what's happening 
It's mainly good. So it'll be some good news. Thank you. Next, please, Kathy. Right, this is us. So you've just seen Hakim. This is his chair because he's so much with us. So we put a chair here for him. Hello, my name is Amani. I'm from Lebanon. I work in an association called Stories Burma. Permaculture Association, and uh, so uh, I worked on a project in 2016 on uh, in, in uh, refugee camps and Syrian refugee camps. As you know, uh, we are uh, like on the border. Uh, Lebanon is on the border of Syria, and uh, when the war starts, so Syrians started to come to Lebanon, and uh, for the six years. I mean, uh, from now, it's been six years that uh, the war is uh, still going on, and we have like a million, 1.5 million of refugees. Uh. Hello, good morning. I am Sarah Kablatin from the Philippines. Um, we'll be sharing about a small initiative um, called Green Relief that I've collectively founded with some friends and permaculturists. Hello, I am Francesca Simonetti from Italy. I am a member of the Italian Permaculture Academy and uh, also I'm collaborating with the association Comoi, which is based in Turin and working with refugees. We'll just have a look. We'll just have a look at some of these slides from Afghan. So the peace volunteers decided instead of trying to fight the military machine, they would act as permaculturists. They would create the alternative, which is what we're doing. So instead of taking on in a big fight, we are creating a brilliant alternative. So their idea is to help the people most in need. So they work with IDPs. We can go. Right, this is on the outskirts of Kabul, 1.8 million people, I think, moved from the 34 provinces the Taliban may take, have taken over. If they take the rest, then Kabul will be under siege, which changed how we taught, because there's no food in Kabul. So we taught for small space, local food. Yep. Water, Kabul River. Does it look like the Seine? Where are those French people? Right. right. People use plastic bags for heating and cooking in winter because there's no fuel or very little unless you're rich. So you burn plastic bags and then you cough. Right. Oh, that looks like the Philippines. Can we continue, please? Uh, right, please continue. So we started teaching on Skype and we had several Skype meetings, they weren't any good and suddenly the peace volunteers aged 14 to 28, they're all babies in my eyes and all dedicated and brilliant activists. I think permaculture is gradually being taken over, the waves coming in of young ones who are capable, generous, fine, non-materialistic. So I, they said it'd be easier if you were here. Well, it wasn't easier to get there, but once I got there, it's easier to be there. Okay, working on Skype's hard. Right, the idea was working small spaces in case Kabul goes under siege and people die without food or water. So that's the sort of courtyard area. Um, then we really worked on nutrition because when people are close to hungry or hungry and likely to go under siege, the main foods you have to get them have to be very intensive, like potatoes, beans, things that will grow and are hardy in a small space and perhaps can be stored. So we can't worry about anything fancy or fruit or even meat. 
but in the generation that I saw, everyone is now getting stunted because they're not getting enough protein. It's happening as you hit the second generation being born into war. Now, right, this, the project was so successful, Kabul University said, will you please come and put in this plot that Ha Kim talked about because of the impact and the cost of um, pesticides and insecticides. Yep. Okay. Now, that was Kabul, so you pretended I was Ha Kim, didn't you? I look just like him. Sort of. Okay. This year, I was in a refugee cam in camp in Kurdistan. Kurdistan has just on half a million, 400 and something thousand refugees. The largest camp is 30. This was a fairly small one. What I learnt was the Syrian refugees could save Kurdistan. So the Iraqi Kurdistanis would like to be independent, bit of political history. So they've had big fights with their army, the Peshmerga fighting against the Iraqi army. The Iraqi army invaded and knocked out nearly all the villages and the food supplies. While the city Erville was under siege, all the timber was cut down, so there are no trees. Imagine teaching permaculture where you don't have farms and you don't have forests and you don't have trees. And you're starting to talk about a forest. And then someone says, we haven't seen a forest. And a forest doesn't lend itself to just talking about. You have to see a forest to know a forest. So this is the camp. And I was there with Paula Palmerman this year and we taught a PDC. You can see everyone is in prison in case one of them is ISIS. So there's this paranoia that there's someone come out of Syria who may be ISIS and on that basis everyone suppressed. Hand out of rations, no autonomy. The two worst things people hate is being on the end of handouts and nothing to do. They hate it. It's like being in a confined prison with nothing to do. It affects people psychologically. So we found that by offering people the course, they had something of interest and something they could do in the camp, and no one protests about people learning permaculture. Little do they know. Okay, so... Um, oh, and the NGO who get there said no one will be interested. No one will want to come. It was advertised on one sheet of paper 24 hours before. 100 turned up. 60 started the course. 43 graduated and we had enough names for second and third course by the time we left. And then they said, OK, if you get this many, no one will finish. No one will finish. And you've got this enormous response. So we just go through. So they were working on turning that camp into an echo village. Now this is what we had to work on. Does any, do any of you recognise this, this print? Can you read it? What is it? Tent material. Hmm? It's from the tent. Oh, thank you. So somehow a tent blew down or the snow and so they're drawing on these. This is a perfect permaculture design for turning a camp into a village. You can see all the site analysis, all the windbreaks, all the water management, all the grey water fixed up, all the forest areas. Oh, I'm glad you're awake. Glad you're not sleeping. So this is a most fabulous design of what people are capable of. When the Finnish government came to inspect the project and six months later they found 50% of the people were pr planting something and that temperature goes from plus 50 to minus 15 under canvas. People doing it hard. People, I think the refugee people throughout the world, there is such a demand there's going to be such a demand for permaculture that that will be the limiting factor. People who can go, and it's hard, and it's difficult, 
and it's chaotic and you get sick and you don't sleep much, but it's still good. Okay, I think we're done. Is that it? Yes. I know. Uh, so I will be talking about uh, Syrian refugee, but in Lebanon. So the situation in Lebanon which is a bit different from Kurdistan. Uh, so, uh, so Lebanon. So as I said before, uh, uh, so there is like 1.5 million Syrian refugees in Lebanon, and uh, ma mainly they are located in two areas. And uh, this, where we worked, it's in Beka, which is a poor area, usually. And it's, uh, like, climatically-wise, it's uh, very hot in the, su in the summer and very uh, cold in the winter. Uh, and uh, so, uh, as you can, also the refugee situation, uh, I will talk a bit about this. So uh, the displacement, they are also displaced even in when, they are, when they arrive in Lebanon, they are always displaced in, the, in different camps. Uh, there is a law in Lebanon who forbids a bit, uh, to, grow in, to grow directly in the soil. So it is a problem for the Syrians to grow around their, uh, their tents. And uh, always limitation in water, and the, the the tents usually are very small, and there is l restriction in space to uh, to be able to grow, uh, and also to grow and spread permaculture practices or uh, agriculture uh, practices. It's a bit difficult to go inside, so uh, we decided. Uh, as you can see here, it's a uh, little bit the situation. Uh, on uh, the picture on the right, you, you see the, there's a narrow space. On the left, it's uh, uh, covered with uh, pebbles. Uh, down, it's concrete. And there is different situation. As you can see, on the right, you, you have, they have a bit space with soil uh, uh, as ground. So uh, soil. Uh, decided to, uh, uh, to to make a project as doing micro gardens inside the camp, but with all this restriction to also to to be able to do it. So we decided to use containers, recycle uh, reusable container as shipment uh, pallets, uh, 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 containers like sand. Uh, small uh, tanks or uh, or jute bags, and uh, and make a small garden uh, so uh, next to the tent, and uh, and with this give sessions in permaculture practices. So uh, so we create solution, and this uh, this project is to provide nutrition to improve the food security because. It's a very, it's a problem that the Syrian refugees are facing, and it's very grave, and it's degrading year after year, and uh, also to improve their livelihood. So as you can see, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we did different prototype of micro-gardening. It depends on, uh, on the situation of each camp. Uh, if it's small, we, we use the uh, tanks, uh, or we also uh, uh, take advantage from the vertical, uh, also do vertical gardening. Uh, so, uh, so that's it. Next slide. And uh, as you can see, after uh, five months, we uh, we were able to uh, to grow food like tomatoes, pumpkins, eggplants, onions, uh, stuff uh, that brings nutritious uh, uh, food for the Syrians and also the Syrians were happy because they felt they are like uh, they are doing something because also they are not able 
to go out from uh, the, the camp and work and also even uh, go uh, uh, do something fun. So, uh, so that's it. Thank you. Hello, good, good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> um, my name is Sarah, I'm from the Philippines. Um, my initiative is called